Throughout seven seasons and 147 episodes, on the Dukes of Hazard, we saw the General Lee perform many incredible stunts, such as massive car jumps over cop cars, trains, hay barns, ponds, rivers, and even a 32-car lineup at the Carnival of Thrills. We saw a lot of epic driving shots of the General Lee ripping around Town Square and tearing up the back roads of Hazard County. We even got to see the General Lee skiing on its two side wheels a few times. But one thing we never saw the General Lee do on the Dukes of Hazard was perform a wheel stand. But did you know it was actually supposed to happen? What's up Rebels, it is Chunky Monkey 40 here with another episode of Things You Didn't Know, Dukes of Hazard Edition. Today we are going to be diving into the story of Rich Sefton's stand-up General Lee. Now before we get into it, be sure to leave a like and also subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already. And if you'd like to support me as a creator, go visit my website, ChunkyMonkey40.com. On there, there's a ton of awesome General Lee merchandise, including Orange Cars Matter and I General Lee Don't Give a Fuck koozies and stickers. But now, let's dive into the story of the stand-up General Lee. <laughs> The story starts with a mechanic named Richard Sefton. He was initially working nights over at Universal Studios working on a TV show called BJ and the Bear. His job was to maintain the many vehicles used on the show, but he needed help. So Rich got his friend Tom Sarmento a job working alongside him on the show. But in August of 1979, the two mechanics got laid off from Universal Studios. This was around the same time that Warner Brothers was moving filming for a TV show called The Dukes of Hazard to Burbank Studios and Lake Sherwood. Rich Sefton and Tom Sarmento were hired by Warner Brothers in September of 1979. Now at the time, this was just another job on another TV show. But little did they know, this TV show would be the start of an everlasting legacy for the two mechanics. At Warner Brothers, Rich Sefton was hired in as the shop foreman, and Tom Sarmento was brought on as the lead mechanic. Tom Sarmento spent most of his time on set, where he was responsible for keeping the cars well-tuned and ready to go for the next shot. But back at the shop is where Rich Sefton and the rest of the Hazard County stunt team worked tirelessly to get the next cars ready. At this time, the main crew, to my knowledge, consisted of Tom Sarmento, Rich Sefton, John Mancini, Mark Lilenthal, and AJ Thrasher. They were in charge of maintaining the 317 Dodge Chargers that were used as General Lees throughout the entire run of the show. But they worked on more than just the General Lee. They also had to maintain the countless cop cars that were used on the show, Daisy's Jeeps, Boss Hogs Cadillacs, and Cooter's Tow Trucks. During his years working on the Dukes of Hazard, Rich Sefton was living in Mission Hills, California. He had moved in with Cam Benty, who at the time was the associate editor over at NHRA Magazine. Well, I met Rich. I was working at um, uh, NHRA. I was working on a magazine called uh, National Dragster, which still exists today. And this guy that I worked with, George Phillips, worked down the street from Rich Sefton, who was kind of a local car guy. I got along very well with Rich. I had a 69 Z28 Camaro, and I didn't have a place to work on it. It was a project for Hot Rod. You can look it up in the magazine. We built it in uh, Rich's backyard. I had moved into a house up in uh, Mission Hills and my roommate moved out and uh, it was a house with a nice garage and had this rather large area in the back and uh, that was perfect for Rich's projects. So The old roommate moved out, um, Rich was looking for a place, he moved in, probably lived there for about four years So and Rich was working uh, on Dukes. So as Rich was building general Lee's for Warner Brothers, Cam Benty became the editor over at Popular Hot Rodding Magazine in April 1982. Cam and Rich were very good friends, and so from time to time, Cam would come over to the Duke's shop and hang out with Rich and all those guys who worked on the show. And Rich would also go to the magazine and go hang out with Cam and the guys who worked there. I had gone from Hot Rod, where I built that Camaro. I went and took a job at a smaller magazine, which was at a publisher called Argus Publishers that had popular hot rodding, which I became the editor pretty shortly after I moved from Hot Rod. So Rich got to meet the people at the magazine. One of the guys at the magazine was a guy named Richard Schroeder, who was a, uh, a big stunt drag kind of guy. He did wheel standers and all kinds of other stuff. And I think what happened was knowing what they needed for the show, because they were always trying to 
to do bigger and better and wilder stunts, that the idea of having a wheel slander might be something very different. You know, they're jumping them all the time. Why don't you make a wheel slander out of one of those general yeah. Lees? And Richard Schroeder, uh, who has passed now, um, helped him with some of the original ideas. The late Richard Schroeder was one of the first guys to embrace the wheel stander craze back in the day. The car you see on screen started out as Richard Schroeder's and it carried the name Bad Bossa Nova. He ran it for years and then eventually turned ownership over to Joe Douthit. In the planning stage of the car with Richard Schroeder, one thing they had to do was figure out where the engine was going to go. The further back the engine was, the easier it would pop up. If you see some of the old classic wheel standers from drag racing lore, they'd get about 20 feet out and the car would just go like this, just sit right up. Well, with Rich's situation, he couldn't put it in the trunk because if they were going to use it for a TV show, the engine had to be housed inside the cabin of the car as opposed to the tail. So that was one of the things he fought because the engine was as, as light as he could get it. He needed a lot of torque to be able to get that thing to rotate. He used like a boat V drive in it so that the engine would run the power to the back and then the rear end was flipped upside down and then it would um, send the power to the rear end. So the wheels would stay in the right spots. The engine would be housed inside the hard top but that was why it was difficult to get it up. He had to have a lot of power and he had to get it going pretty fast right off the bat. Rich Sefton approached the producers of the Dukes of Hazard about possibly having a General Lee that was capable of popping a wheelie. He quickly realized that they were interested in the idea and so it began. He started to search junkyards high and low for a 69 Dodge Charger that would be a decent starting point for him to build what would later become famously known as the Stand Up General. According to James Smith, a well-known stuntman from Duke's Fest and Bose Extravaganza who also helped Rich Sefton restore the stand-up general in 2003, Rich Sefton was working at the Dukes of Hazard mechanic shop when someone came by to offer up a 1969 Dodge Charger to be used on the show. Somebody came by the shop there at 7734 San Fernando Road where the shop was and said, hey Rich, we got a 69 Charger for sale if you guys want to use it, you know, and so he's, I think he said, yeah, we'll go look at it at lunchtime or whatever, it's just down the road so he goes and looks at it and it had a banged up side and it needed a quarter panel and so rich said no we're not interested in, in it for the show and i don't know if he made a deal at the time or if he went back later but i think when he got to dreaming about the stand-up general lee thing he said oh maybe i'll go buy that one it had a perfect grill i mean the grill was flawless and still is so it had a few pieces that he could use that was really nice shape so he bought that car himself personally now that rich had the car it was time to begin the build and lucky for him he worked on the Dukes of Hazard. Not only was he very familiar with the 1969 Dodge Charger, but he had lots of free parts at his disposal that he could take home from work and put on the car. And he did. And off of several jump cars, he robbed pieces that was gonna be scrapped, like the deck lid and the hood are off of actual generally jumped cars. The quarter panel that on the right hand side, because they cut it right through the taillight panel, right up the side and right up over the roof and back down to, to put the whole side in the car. And those are that that whole piece is off of a jumped General Lee. So it has a number of pieces in it built into it that is off of real General Lees that were jumped, screen used on the Dukes of Hazard. The man who helped Rich with most of the fabrication work on the stand up General was the same guy who did it on Dukes, AJ Thrasher. AJ Thrasher was the guy who fabricated all the roll cages in the stunt cars on the Dukes of Hazard. You knew the stunt car was good to go when AJ Thrasher left a big glob of red man's chewing tobacco on the dashboard. That was his signature that meant, hey, this car's safe, good to go, go destroy it. But AJ Thrasher did a number of things on the stand-up general, including helping Rich replace the quarter panel section that James Smith talked about. They cut the whole bottom end out of the back of the car, AJ fabricated a new frame to house the engine in the back seat, and AJ Thrasher also built the roll cage for the stand-up general, just like he did on all the other General Lees on the show. They did almost all of this stuff outside of work. So Rich's roommate, Cam Benty, got to know AJ Thrasher quite well throughout the build. 
AJ was just a super, super nice guy. When you met him at uh, the shop, he would always be wearing uh, some t-shirt with burn holes in it from welding. And then he had a flannel shirt over whether it was hot or cold. And then he would wear a plastic Arkansas Razorback hat and had a big wad of red man chew in his jaw. So he was this giant of a man. So we ended up using him as a character in one of our ongoing uh, sections for popular hot rodding called AJ Talks Tech, which was a spinoff of what I had done at Hot Rod, where we had a guy who did a very serious column called CJ Talks Tech. That was kind of a spinoff on that. I never heard whether CJ was upset about it. I knew CJ, but we just didn't care that much. We were having, we were having a good time. Cam told me about an edition of AJ Talks Tech that they did in February 1983, where AJ showed you how to install wide tires and wheels on a General Lee. It doesn't say it in the magazine that it's a General Lee, but it's a General Lee. If you look at the top left corner of the picture, you can see on the top of the car a little bit of the corner of the Rebel flag. And plus, that's clearly an orange 69 Dodge Charger with vector wheels on it. But it's pretty funny. I mean, he goes to the car, cuts the whole quarter panel off, and simply just puts on the tire. <laughs> I just wanted to add that in there though because Rich Sefton and AJ Thrasher were really good friends and clearly had a lot of good times together working on the Dukes of Hazard. Anyways, back to the stand-up general. In this particular General Lee that they are building, the engine sits right behind the driver in the back seat. Rich's engine of choice for the car was a stroked 440 CID Mopar unit with a BDS supercharger system set up to run on alcohol by Bob Lambeck and Bob Lambeck was one of the most well-known and successful drag racers of the San Fernando Valley back in the day. And when I found out that the stand-up general is run on alcohol, I was like, dude, that is fucking badass. Because in the Dukes of Hazard, they used alcohol as gasoline. Season one, episode five, Uncle Jesse runs his moonshining car, Black Tilly, on moonshine. What is that fuel? Whiskey, moonshine whiskey, the famous Duke family recipe. Easy to make and easy to take. The Dukes were former moonshiners and the stand-up general being run on alcohol, it just fits. Towards the end of the build, Rich brought the car to set so that he could have it painted by Leon. Leon was one of the guys who worked at the body shop there at Warner Bros. Leon painted General Lee's, cop cars, everything. So the stand-up general was painted with real General Lee paint by the General Lee painter. And it's even got parts of real General Lee's built into the car. So that's pretty cool. I would say this was also right about the same time that the picture with John Schneider and Rich Sefton was taken on the Burbank backlot with the stand-up general. Now even though he had the car painted orange and he also had intentions to put it on the Dukes of Hazard, he didn't quite know if he was ready to make it a full-fledged General Lee right off the get. This was sometime around about 1984 and after $26,000 in two years was invested into this car by Rich, the word around town was that the Dukes of Hazard would be coming to an end that year. Rich was also having some small tuning issues with the car that needed some work, and he wasn't quite sure if he'd be able to get it all done in time for the car to be able to appear on the Dukes of Hazard. However, he did put a rebel flag on the roof, but he never put an 01 on the car. That was done later, but we'll get to that. Oop. Whoa. That was close. <laughs> when it was time to talk to the producers again, they said they had an idea for the car possibly being used in the Dukes of Hazard series finale. The producers thought it would be cool to see Bo and Luke in the General Lee riding off into the sunset in a full-blown wheelie. But first, they wanted to see the car in action. So shortly after that conversation, Rich was invited to bring the car to the Burbank backlot for a trial run. I was there the day they took it to um, downtown Hazard, you know, the set. The day that Rich brought the car down, because he had talked with you know, Paul Picard and some of these other folks, the Baxleys, all of the actors were there that same day because it was downtown Hazard, and so they were all watching what was going on. And the hardest part was, like I said, for him to get that nose to pop up, so he had to get a certain amount of speed before it would, it would lift. And... Um, it never did. It probably got, you know, a foot to 18 inches off the ground because there were things to hit. I mean, you got the whole center of the downtown area there and it never worked at that point. Uh, it was disappointing. 
Rich, I know, was very disappointed. He, he felt so rotten that he didn't get to do what he wanted to do, what he built the car to do. Because there's many pictures of it that Cam Benty took up at LACR Raceway in Palmdale, California, with the car right up on its hind wheels just going right down the drag strip. And, and Rich said he would just take his brake, which would stop one tire or the other, and he could just manipulate the front end, and he would just drive it down the all the way to the end on the rear wheels and he was he was good at it you know but that day the day that he needed it the most it didn't want to work right and he was in a tight area which is also bad the biggest problem you have when the car is up at that height is seeing most of the sighting was off the sides you know trying to figure out where you were you know if you're going down a drag strip just where's the guardrail with as many uh cars as they busted up you know they he didn't want to bust this one up but that was also towards the very end of the show's production so they moved to the models was cheaper, less risk, all the kinds of things that you don't want to hear because it's awesome to see these cars jump. He was on the very end of that whole deal. There was a time crunch. He was still working to get the car done. And uh, then when it didn't perform that day, I think that kind of was the end of the deal. He told me later, it was many, many years later, that he said, I think I know why it didn't work good. He was, he was you know, nervous and wanting to make it just perfect, and he had adjusted the brakes up. And he says, I had the rear brakes adjusted a little too tight, and it wouldn't pivot the car as easily. Because before, he could just give it gas, and it would just come right up. And that day, it didn't want to raise the front end. So after several shots, Paul Baxley finally said, that's it, you're done, forget it. So it never made it in the episode. It never actually got filmed on two wheels, on the rear wheels. That was going to be the last shot of the car on its rear hind wheels going into the sunset with a, with a silhouette of Daisy, Luke, and Bo in the, in the back window. February 8th, 1985. The Dukes of Hazard aired its series finale, opening night at the Boar's Nest. The episode was not only the series finale, but it was also John Schneider's debut as a director. But the episode aired and unfortunately there was no shots of the General Lee doing a wheelie off into the sunset. However, upon doing my own research, I think I found a scene that to me makes sense as to where the stand-up General Lee might have initially been intended to go. So in this episode, there were two bad guys that had intentions of killing Boss Hogg. Their first attempt to kill Boss Hogg in the episode was in Hazard Town Square, which was also where they attempted to use the wheel standing General Lee in the show. When the bad guys started heading towards Boss Hogg, the Duke boys cut the bad guys off and saved Boss's life. The bad guys then drove off, and I believe that when the Duke boys chased after them, that was where the producers were initially wanting to place the stand-up general in the episode. And to me, that makes sense because they attempted to shoot that scene with the stand-up general on the downtown set. That part in the episode, I believe, is the only part in the episode that takes place in Downtown Hazard. Now that's my own personal belief. I came up with that while writing this script based upon what I've heard from Cam Benty and James Smith. And I mean, just imagine how badass and how much of a surprise it would have been to see the Duke boys just turn around and chase after some bad guys in a full-blown fucking wheelie. That would have been sweet. But then I believe when it didn't work, I have a theory that after they tried to do it on the downtown set, Rich, who is eager to get the car into the show any way possible, pitched the infamous idea of Bo, Luke, and Daisy riding off into the sunset doing a full-blown wheelie. The only downtown scene in the episode was towards the beginning, whereas the episode's last scene takes place at the Boar's Nest, with all of the cast together celebrating Boss Hogg's arrival after Roscoe made him disappear. <laughs> but if they were to have the Duke boys doing a wheelie in the General Lee leaving the Boar's Nest, that'd be pretty difficult to do because the Boar's Nest is on a dirt road. I don't think a car doing a wheelie on a dirt road would be all that safe. But nevertheless, Sadly, the stand-up General Lee never made it into a scene on the Dukes of Hazard. After the Dukes of Hazard came to an end, Rich continued working on picture cars for a few more years, but he eventually moved on to working at a college prep school in LA called Harvard Westlake High School. Rich Sefton worked in both the athletic department and the automotive department. But at this time, Rich didn't really get to take the car out that much because he was busy with work, a wife, and he was also raising three kids. But whenever he was free, Rich loved to take the stand-up general to the Los Angeles County Raceway from time to time. The car also appeared in several magazine articles, including the November 1985 edition of Popular Hot Riding Magazine. 
and the article was actually written by Cam Benty. This magazine actually detailed a lot of the mechanical components of the car, alongside revealing some of the people who helped Rich Sefton build the car, including AJ Thrasher, Al Rifkin, Mark Lilenthal, Paul Saborn, Tom West, and Mike Weaver, all of whom were guys who also worked on the Dukes of Hazard alongside Rich and Tom Sarmento. Rich Sefton truly loved the stand-up general, and I could see why. It probably brought back a lot of good memories for Rich from his time working on the Dukes of Hazard. And also a lot of his friends helped him build the car, so he really had a lot of attachment to it. But despite the Dukes of Hazard being over, Rich still had a lot of big plans for the car. What he really wanted to do was do a tour. He had the ear of a lot of the guys that worked on the show, and I'm sure the licensing folks would have been a challenge for him, but having uh, guys like Picard or Baxley on his side would help him get uh, the ability to run that car around. So his feeling was he wanted to go to different shows, show it off, get paid for different uh, presentations, and doing you know do a little run around. And he had a um, contract already signed with Stroh's Beer. They were going to put an S1 on the door for Stroh's, and it was going to be do wheel stands at some different shows up and down the West Coast, like some drag race events. At this time in the late 1980s, Stroh's Beer was doing everything they could to gain national publicity. They were well known in their home state of Michigan as they had been sponsoring the Detroit Tigers radio show since the 1960s. However, in 1984, they started trying to really expand out. They came out with a mascot, Alex the Dog. It was entertaining, they had the dog run for president and all this other stuff, but they needed something that better reflected the brand, and the stand-up general was the perfect candidate for it. For those who might not know, Stroh's beer back in the 80s was well known for their signature fire brewing style. So the idea of having a car similar to the General Lee, which was still very popular at the time, that could both pop wheelies and spit flames out of the headers, it would have fit the brand very well with the S1 on the door for Stroh's one. I think it would have done great things for the brand, but as all of this was getting worked out, disaster struck. Rich Sefton and his wife were caught in a very nasty divorce that really changed everything. Now, I'm going to read all of this straight from the Facebook post that Rich's daughter, Amanda Sefton, wrote regarding the stand-up General Lee on December 23rd, 2009. Amidst the divorce, there was the usual custody battle for the kids, and Rich's soon-to-be ex-wife hired the nastiest of nasty lawyers to handle the divorce. One day in 1989, Rich was summoned to a sheriff's department in Southern California to have photographs taken of the car to determine its value for legal proceedings in the divorce. When Rich arrived, he was told that he would have to leave the car there until further notice to allow someone with the expertise to put a value on such a car. Rich left, knowing in his heart that something wasn't right. The next day, Rich went back to the police station to get his car, only to find out that it was no longer there. He was told that the car had been sold in a lien sale to collect money for unpaid child support. Rich tried to explain that he had paid all his child support and that there had been a mistake, but he was told he would have to take it up with a judge. Well indeed he did, and he received a federal court document which in layman's terms basically said that the sale of the car was illegal and that the car was to be returned to Mr. Sefton, and that the ruling was final and may only be overturned by the same court that issued it which was the federal court in Ventura County, California. This, of course, is not what happened. So basically what she's saying there is that Rich's ex-wife stole the stand-up general from him and had her attorney illegally sell the car to some folks up in Washington. His ex's lawyer claimed that the car was only sold for $1,000, which is a load of BS considering the fact that Rich put $26,000 into building the car. But the attorney supposedly sold it for $1,000 and turned the whole $1,000 over to the courts. Yeah, that happens. But the attorney supposedly turned over the $1,000 to the court for uncollected child support fees. And still to this day, it is unknown what the car was actually sold for. But whatever the difference was after the $1,000 went to the court system, all that money left over stayed in both that greedy lawyer's pocket and his ex-wife's pocket. After all of that went down in 1989, Rich would spend the next 13 years looking for his car. 
Yes, his car. I mean, he literally had a federal court order stating that the sale of the car was illegal and that the car should be returned to him. Rich also had the original bill of sale for the car on file and he also held the original title to the car as well. He had everything very well documented to prove that this was his car. So 13 years, no leads, nothing. But in the September 2002 issue of Mopar Collector's Guide, they ran an article titled Found. Lost Wheel Standard General Lee Built for Last TV Episode. When this article was published, a lot of information had come out about where the stand-up general had been for the last 13 years. In 2002, the car was in possession of a dude from Washington State. Mopar Collector's Guide did an interview with the guy on Sunday, May 5th at the 21st Annual All Mopar Spring Roundup in Seattle. He brought the car to the show specifically because he knew the magazine was going to be there. Mopar Collector's Guide asked him a ton of questions about the car. The first one being, where'd you get it from? Mopar Collector's Guide wrote, The Charger's current owner first laid eyes on the Charger at a swap meet in Portland, Oregon around 1993. At the time, the Charger was pretty much just as you see it here, except it wasn't wearing the 01 in General Lee graphics. The original widened turbine wheels had already been replaced with the center lines it still wears, and the front push bar was gone. And so upon seeing the car at the swap meet, this guy went into a partnership with a friend of his so that they could come up with the money to purchase the car. The Charger had initially been sold to an enthusiast in Yakima, Washington, then it was sold in short order to another fella from Seattle. It was one of those men who added the Zumi exhaust stacks and changed out the wheels and tires. Neither of them had apparently ever made any quarter mile passes in the car. So once these new guys got the stand-up general in their possession, they took it to their local drag strip in late 1993. The two partners said that they were amazed at how easy it was to get the Charger's nose airborne. On one of their passes, they got the Charger's nose three feet up in the air and didn't even notice. However, their fun was short-lived when they realized that the transmission was slipping. They found out that the torque flight had toasted itself. So what did they do, you might ask? Did they fix it? Well... <laughs> Rather than fixing it, these two geniuses decided to just place the car in storage so that they could have more time to focus on their other Mopars. The stand-up general was forgotten about for several years and the two partners kind of just moved on in their lives. Eventually, one of the two partners decided it'd be cool to do a grand rebuild of the Charger, but at the time he was very busy working for 7-Up. In the late 1990s, one of the beverages that was distributed by 7-Up was Sunkist Orange Soda. And this guy, who was a marketer for the Sunkist and 7-Up brands, he decided it'd be a good idea to basically get some magnetic Sunkist signs, slap them on the doors of the Charger, and essentially pimp it out to the whole Seattle area to try and raise money to help get the car rebuilt. The idea was that the stores would have the car sit outside and that would bring the customers in. In the interview with them about the wheel stander in September 2002, it was stated that the idea was a hit and soon they were overwhelmed with requests from store owners who wanted the charger on display to suck in more customers. They did that for a short period and upon raising enough money to fix the car, they began with finally installing the 01 graphics on the door and the General Lee graphics on the roof right next to the Rebel flag. The two partners also installed a Dixie horn under the hood but a Dixie horn and some decals don't make a car run, of course, so it was finally time for them to go about fixing the car. But as the project was nearing its completion, one of the partners passed away. The partner that passed actually was the driving force in the project. He was the one who worked at 7-Up and wanted to actually restore the car. So his passing led the restoration project to a dead stop. A few months went by and eventually the remaining partner finished up the rebuilding of the torque flight just in time for the 2002 All Mopar Spring Roundup. That's where he did the interview with Mopar Collector's Guide talking about the stand-up general, which turned out to be a mistake on his part, but it was a blessing for Rich Sefton. When Rich first saw the article, the wheels were turning in his head as he was trying to figure out how he was going to get his car back. Rich began digging through all of the paperwork that he had for the car, and the federal court order which again stated that the car had been illegally sold in 1989 by Rich's ex-wife and her greedy lawyer. Rich was beginning to think that he actually had a good shot of seeing his car again in his own garage where it rightfully should have been all along. 
He knew it was out there, and he knew it was somewhere in Washington, but all he had to do now was find the exact location. In spring of 2003, Rich found exactly what he needed. He found out where the stand-up general was going to be and what time it was going to be there. The car was set to be in Indianapolis that afternoon. So Rich wasted no time in contacting the Indy Police Department and also a local repo company. The repo guys found the stand-up General Lee in a car trailer left alone in a hotel parking lot. So the repo crew moved in and scooped up the stand-up general. And Rich then met up with them that same day. Rich was ecstatic. He was finally looking at his car for the first time in over 13 years. And he was ready to get it back home and take it out to the drag strip. So there in Indianapolis, Rich bought a trailer, loaded it up, and took it back home to LA. Not too long after getting the stand-up general back home, Rich took it out to the Thunder Valley drag strip in Lexington, Oklahoma, but he didn't know much of anything about the car's current state. I mean, it had been 13 years since he's even seen the thing. The only thing that he knew was that the car would run. He just didn't know how well. He wanted to do a few runs down the track and attempt a wheel stand. But when he went to go start up the car, the blower just blew right off the top of the engine and put a massive dent in the roof of the car. He did a little bit of looking into it and he found out pretty quickly that almost everything in the car was pretty much ass backwards and it was going to need a full on restoration yet again. And to restore the car, Rich contacted Bob and James Smith of Smith Rose Restoration to help him out. We were back and forth to LA and in 2003 he had the car over at the body shop because when he blew the blower off of it in Oklahoma on it, uh, it put a dent in the roof so he got the roof fixed at the body shop as soon as he got back. But he had the engine out and so there was pieces of it in his shop and we were there a couple times. The rest of the car was over at the body shop and um, getting touched up and some a little bit of repaint done on it. While working alongside Bob and James Smith, Rich remembered how much fun it was to work on the stand-up general. Only this time around, he was able to have his daughter Amanda by his side for pretty much the entire restoration. But after 13 years, some things had changed. Remember that guy from Washington who Rich repoed the car from? Well, now he felt that the car was stolen from him. While Rich Sefton and the Smith brothers were hard at work trying to restore the car, the Washington dude pursued legal action to try and get the car back from Rich. The judge issued a state court order that said that the car needed to be returned back to the guy in Washington. Meanwhile, Rich has a federal court order that says that the car is rightfully his. So when word got back to Rich about him getting a state court order stating that Rich needed to give the car back, he really wasn't too threatened by it. Rich was confident that the federal court order would override the state court order. After all, Rich also held the original title to the car and he also had all of the documentation that proved that this was his car that he built in the early 1980s. So he wasn't threatened by it, he wasn't too faced by it, and he continued on with the restoration. By June of 2003, the restoration of the car was nearing completion. And so, Rich thought it would be a cool idea to bring it to the 25th Anniversary Dukes event in Covington, Georgia, where Corey Eubanks jumped the General Lee for the first time since the show had ended. In preparation for the event, Rich put together a ton of merchandise for the car. He had stand-up General Lee shirts and posters made. The shirts were made in white, black, and blue. And the poster featured many different photos of Rich and AJ Thrasher building the car. And it also had photos of what it looked like when Rich first bought it from the junkyard. At the 25th anniversary event, Rich had one goal. Well, it was pouring down rain, so we couldn't do a demonstration with it. So Rich figured, well, at least let's just start it up and let him hear it run under that pavilion. So, so the generally jump car that my brother and I had thrown together and painted and I hauled across the nation for Tom Cermeno to get caged by Roush Racing and, and wheels on it and get it ready to go for the jump, for Corey to jump. It's the car that I donated personally that I hauled to them was sitting right next to the wheel standard. Hmm. So that was my General Lee that they jumped and um, my brother and I was there working on the wheel standard with Rich. He asked me, because I had just found two original push bars in the weeds in Valencia, he asked me if I would build him an aluminum push bar for the wheel stander based on the one that I had in my hands. So I laid it down and traced around it and TIG welded together an aluminum push bar and painted it black, hauled it to Georgia, and we put the push bar on his wheel stander in the parking lot of the Holiday Inn at Conyers where the cast stayed in 1978. And that push bar is still on it right now at the Fulno Museum. Rich's one goal at the 25th anniversary was to start the car up. He couldn't do a demonstration due to the rain, so he just wanted to start it up and let the fans hear it run at the show. 
and that's exactly what they did. It took a little bit, but the thing started up and dang, that thing is loud as hell. <laughs> Alright, so there's a couple things I'd like to bring up about this footage. This footage is the only known footage of the stand-up General Lee. Like, there's none. That's why you guys haven't seen any video up until now of the car. And then the two guys you see in the video is, of course, Bob and James Smith. Bob is wearing the green coveralls, and James Smith is in the light blue shirt. And my favorite part of the footage is when you see the car finally start up, everybody in the background plugs their ears almost in unison. After all these years and all these issues with the car, it was finally getting to do what it was built to do. And that is, of course, entertain the fans of the Dukes of Hazard. And my last little side note is, you can see pretty clearly how the car fills up with smoke right as the engine starts finally going. And I feel like that's why Rich referred to the cab of the car as the hot box on the poster. Because it goes up in smoke Cheech and Chong style. At this point, things were looking out pretty good for the stand-up general. That very next year in summer of 2004, Rich Sefton was invited to bring the stand-up general to Duke's Fest in Bristol, Tennessee, where he had planned to have James Smith drive it in the stunt show. The restoration was pretty much complete, but it had a couple more things that needed some finishing. So Rich decided he would make the trip. He packed up his stuff, got all the merchandise and the car together, and it was off to Tennessee with the stand-up general in tow. His plan was to meet up with Bob and James Smith first so that they could put the finishing touches on the car. I'm going to read this part about Duke's Fest straight from Amanda Sefton's Facebook post about the stand-up general. She wrote, It was 9 a.m. on Saturday, the first day of the two-day event, and Rich had not yet taken the stand-up general out of the trailer. He couldn't explain it, but he had a funny feeling. Finally, he got tired of everyone asking, when are you going to take the car out of the trailer? And so he pulled down the trailer door and rolled the car out. The Smith brothers began working on the car with Rich, trying to get it finished up for James to drive that day. But suddenly, within minutes, four Tennessee state troopers were coming across the parking lot with their lights and sirens blaring. Rich asked the first trooper that stepped out of his car, what's the problem, officer? To which the trooper replied, we are here for a stolen car. Rich asked him, what stolen car? And the trooper said, that one, with his finger pointed right at the stand-up general. Rich's heart sank as he realized what was happening. A flatbed tow truck approached and began loading the car up on the back. Rich Sefton and the Smith brothers had to drop everything they were doing to fix the car, and the Tennessee state troopers took it away from them. 
Rich showed the detective on scene all of his documentation, including the federal court order, which again stated that the car belonged to Rich. All the detective had to say on scene was that it was going to have to be taken up with a federal judge come Monday morning. But he claimed that there was nothing that they could do about it. I haven't thought about this stuff since 2004. I was standing right there working on the car. We had tools in our hand when they, when the state patrol disregarded our federal court order and loaded the car up and hauled it away from us. And then Rich jumped in the Roscoe car with me and we drove out to the state highway patrol so he could show them the great work and that no, our car was never there. They said, oh, it'll be there. They lied, Every everyone on that whole that whole thing down there, whether they were paid or, or something, whoever was in charge of that whole unit, maybe all, maybe the rest of them didn't know what was going on. They were just supporting their boss but somebody had paid them to just ignore every piece of paperwork and say, this is my car. I have a state court order saying it should be brought back. And they disregarded the federal court order and, and upheld the state court order. So there was a lot going on very wrong there. Rich was very, very upset. In her post, Amanda Sefton wrote, Rich spent the next few years telling this story to everyone he could. Everyone from FBI agents to detectives and everyone told him the same thing. Yes, it's your car. Yes, you were given a great injustice by the legal system. But they also all had the same advice about getting the car back. Hire a lawyer and go after them in court. Now at this point, Rich was already retired. He had one kid in college and he had two newly graduated kids. And so he didn't have the money to just hire a lawyer and go after the stand-up general again. But he really wanted to though. He was very upset at the fact that his car had been stolen from him twice now. But he began taking the steps of moving on in life. Hoping that karma would come back around and deal him a sweet hand. Rich had plans to marry his girlfriend of three years and move out of California to Oklahoma where he wanted to build a house with a massive mechanics shop and just try to move forward in life. He wanted to work on all types of cars just for fun and enjoy his retirement. But on March 14th, 2007, those dreams were abruptly cut short when Rich Sefton had suddenly and unexpectedly passed away from diabetes. He passed away the day after his 59th birthday. Rich Sefton's passing was a devastating loss for the family, and he was mourned by both the car community and by Dukes of Hazard fans from all around the world. Uh, Rich, Rich was a very good friend, you know, he really helped out, starting with, you know, when I was building that car in his backyard for Hot Rod Magazine, because I had no shop and no place to go. We built it all in the backyard, it, it worked out. He was very kind and very generous and let me uh, work in his backyard. He was always quick with a comment or, or a, uh, a barb, shall we say, <laughs> which was certainly welcome because we'd throw it back at him just the same. But um, yeah, super, super nice guy, good friend, I miss him. Um, we had a lot of fun. We did a lot of really uh, entertaining things over the years. He was a good man. He was a great man. He was. He had a. He had a, a certain sarcasm to him that anybody that knows him would would laugh because he 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 was a I told you so kind of guy. He knew he was right. Oh, he would rub it in. But that's the part about him that we laugh about that we we cherish that because he was such a good soul. You know, if he knew that you needed help, he would go. To the, he would bend over backwards to help you. It was one of those situations where if you if you don't know if you're right. You better not you better not make a claim because he would point it out <laughs> he would definitely <laughs> laugh at you and, and, and make you make a public public spectacle of it you know so he was he was a unique guy and a, and a great great friend some of the best memories that we had was helping rich in georgia because we were there with a whole weekend with him and amanda towing it back and forth to the hotel putting the push bar on it in the parking lot where the the famous holiday inn where the duke started you know, I was very green to the stunt world at that point. I hadn't been around car stunts in person. So my brother and I were just there. We brought a lot of tools with us. So we were there to help anybody and anything that was gonna make the event successful. And so we wound up working our tails off all weekend long and it was some of the best memories ever. Because of that weekend, I'm in the film business now because the guys that I was working under is the best and the greatest in Hollywood now, like Henry Kenji, Jack Gill was there, Corey Eubanks. It was, a, I mean, the A-team was there of the stunt guys. And I work with Jack now on movies like Fast and the Furious. And um, him and I has coordinated John Schneider stuff in the last five years down at Bo's Extravaganza, all John's movies. Those moments with the wheel stander set the pace because I started driving cars on two wheels that same year. And the next year at Bristol Motor Speedway is where I showed Ben Jones footage of me driving a car on two wheels. And he said, hey, that's great. Let's do that next year here. I'll have Tom build a car for you. So that started my career in the business was working with those guys right there and with Rich Sefton and with the wheel stander. So what now? Whatever happened to the legendary stand-up General Lee? Well, when the guy in Washington got the car back, he placed it right back where he kept it before, in storage. 
The car was left alone and basically forgotten about for a long time. But as for the Dukes of Hazard fans, the stand-up general and Rich Sefton were never forgotten about. Just recently, in November 2022, I see a post in one of the Dukes of Hazard fan groups I'm in on Facebook, and the post has pictures, new pictures of the stand-up general. Upon doing a little bit of digging, I found out that the car had been acquired by the Volo Auto Museum in Volo, Illinois. The photos I found were from Brian Grams' Facebook page. Brian is the museum director over at the Volo Auto Museum. I contacted Brian Grams and asked him if he'd be willing to do an interview. He agreed, and so here's what he had to say. I'm curious, so how did you hear about the stand-up General Lee? Uh, they contacted me. It was a middleman, so that they uh, have been the caretaker of the stand-up uh, you know, General Lee for uh, many years now, and the woman that owned the car uh, was looking to sell it, wanted to know if we were interested. We had interest. <laughs> you know, we're a collector car dealer uh, before we are a museum, so we do a lot of buying and selling. People can submit their cars for sale, and that's what they did. As of right now, on December 3rd, what is the state of the car? How does it sit? Does it run? No, um, I mean, they told me when uh, I purchased it, they hadn't had the car running in, you know, 15, 20 years. Basically, it's just been sitting in a warehouse. You know, we got it, it was covered with, you know, a lot of dirt, a lot of dust. Our plan right now is to do some type of unveiling and go through the mechanics on it, uh, you know, see what kind of condition they're in. And, you know, hopefully we can get it, you know, running and... Uh, so you guys plan to maybe take it to the drag strip and uh, pop a wheelie in it? No, we're not race car drivers here, we're a museum, so it'll it'll be fun for, uh, you know, firing up, hearing a lot of noise and that, but we'll, we'll never, you know, it'll be more of a historic piece. And it's definitely got a lot of history to it. It's got a very colorful life, let's just say. Yeah, yeah, you know, once, uh, once we acquire the car, I, you know, anytime I get, uh, you know, we got a bunch of different TV and movie cars here, and anytime we get some, I spend a lot of time digging into the background and the history, and you know, found out the uh, colorful story that uh, yeah <laughs> came, came with it, and you'll know, talk to uh, you know, a lot of people that are involved with the car. So, where does the family stand with the car? Are they happy to maybe see it going into the museum, and that it's finally going to have a, like a stable environment to live in, to where the fans can see it and enjoy it? Yeah, um, you know, once I I learned the story, um, you know that. That wasn't something that I was involved with, uh, and I, you know, I'm not a judge. I can't tell you who's right or who's wrong, but I know that there's, uh, you know, the car means a lot for the family. Uh, it'll always be Richard's car. You know, that's how we kind of want to present it. And, you know, put it on display here, uh, you know, as a tribute to him. Uh, and the family is is happy that that's, you know, kind of putting the end to the madness of the car and, uh, you know, a good outcome. What do you think Rich would say today in regards to the stand-up General Lee going into the Volo Museum? Of course, he'd rather see it in his garage, but do you think yeah. he'd be happy to see it going on display for the Dukes fans from all over to see? No doubt. No doubt. You know, he loved that show and he loved that part of his life. You know, he worked on a lot of other shows. He worked on Magnum. You know, he was an amazing um, problem solver, like, you know, battery issues in Magnum, or there was a situation with a grounding out on that big semi and DJ and the bear. So he was always on set fixing stuff. But um, the General Lee was his favorite by far. And the fact that other people can see it and enjoy it, there's no doubt he would be super happy about that. You know, if he was alive right now and he couldn't tour with it, he would be happy that it was out on display. When they first got the car, they called, they texted me immediately and said, hey, we've got the stand-up general because they knew my brother and I had a fair, a fair amount of involvement. I mean, we have a whole file in our file cabinet with all the federal court orders that Rich had entrusted to us in case something happened to him. So we have a file about that thick on that car and plus a little history of helping him work on it. I immediately, when they reached out to me and said, well, how do you feel about this? You know, we got this car. I said, well, my only thought is what how does Amanda feel about it? It's Amanda Sefton's decision on really what happens with it. I mean, they bought and paid for it, but she could push the issue and push the federal court order if she wants to go that far. But she understands that the bitterness that that car created with her dad is what killed her dad. And she, she basically said, I'm not going to let a car kill me. And unfortunately with Rich, it was a, it was a passion and it was, it was a source of a lot of frustration and bitterness for a lot of years with him. And uh, cause he couldn't let it go. Um, Amanda has let it go, but on the other hand, it's back now and it's in the public eye. And when they said she's good with it, 
she obviously said it would be better if it was in her garage, but she's okay that it's been purchased. It's not sitting in a barn somewhere being hit out again. It's in the public eye. It's doing what it should be doing. And I hope that she puts the Stand Up General collection together of merchandise and starts going to the shows and merchandising the car because now you can go see the car and you can also buy a t-shirt. You know, I don't, I don't consider myself, you know, the owner of the car. We're just the, the current caretakers of it. Uh, it'll always be Richard's car. You know, that's how we kind of want to present it. You know, put it on display here. When we do the uh, unveiling, the family's invited to come out. I believe, uh, you know, Amanda agreed to come out. Uh, kind of doing a, a charity event that would benefit diabetes because her uh, father uh, passed away from diabetes. So we want to make a nice event that you will know, do the family proud and, uh, you know, represent it and display it in a way that, you know, will tribute their uh, you know, father, Richard. The event that Brian Grams and the Volo Auto Museum are hosting will be on June 3rd, 2023. It is the Richard Sefton Memorial Mopar Show, and it will be benefiting the American Diabetes Association. This event is supposed to be centered around not only remembering Richard Sefton, but it's also gonna feature the Volo Museum's two historic General Lees, the stand-up General Lee and the Don Schistler General Lee, and also two Fast and Furious Dodge Chargers. There is also going to be a special guest appearance from Tom Sarmento, and yes, I am going to the event. I am looking forward to seeing the stand-up general in person for the first time. That's going to be pretty cool. And plus, now this is a little off topic, but the Volo Museum is also going to have a Titanic exhibit. And for those of you guys who don't know, I am a huge Titanic nerd. So that is going to be really cool to be able to see a ton of Titanic stuff and also the stand-up general. And the Don Schistler General Lee is going to be there as well. And as Brian said in his interview, they do plan to get the stand-up general running so that they could start it up in front of the crowd and let us hear it run. So I'm pretty excited for that as well. It's going to be a good time. I wish they were going to do a wheel stand in it though. It would be really cool if they got James Smith out there to throw him in the car and get him to put it on his back two wheels one time. Because he was supposed to do it. That'd be really cool. That'd be a cool addition to the event. But I understand why they're not going to do it. Because it is in fact a historic piece. And I think the last thing that they would want to do is damage the car in any way. And so I get it. But I'll be there vlogging with my camera. So I hope to see some of you guys there and get you in the video maybe. Thank you guys for watching. Be sure to leave a like and also subscribe to my YouTube channel for plenty more Dukes of Hazard videos just like this. And if you'd like to help support me as a YouTube creator, there is an option below the video to leave a super thanks or a super chat. And plus, I also do have my website, chunkymonkey40.com shop. So if you want to get yourself something cool on there, it'll be linked at the top of the description. And every purchase really does help me out a lot in making these big videos. So if you'd like to support me, that's how you do it. If you made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. But with all that said and out of the way, I am ChunkyMonkey40 at YouTube.com. Stay rebel, y'all. Just some good old boys Never need no harm Beats all you ever saw in a trouble